Now, I couldn't get a job in my own company. I'll tell you that right now. If I am, was uh, applying to work at uh, one of my companies, I would fail. I don't think I would get the job. I don't think my HR department would give me the job. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show is a doozy. We're going to dig into the fourth industrial economy topic I love talking about, understanding why society is changing and what great impacts can affect you as a property investor. Today's show is a big one. We're going to crack some codes, that's for sure. Tell you what, if you're watching from YouTube, uh, I am in the bunker. I am in the bunker. I'm like Winston Churchill stuck in my bunker. Yes, the hearth and homers are out in force in my street. These people are renovating like beyond belief. I am now resorting to hiding in my man cave. I am basically under the house in a man cave If I get asthma during this conversation, I am going to have to run out and find my puffer. Things have really gone feral in my street. Gospodars have taken over the neighborhood. They are renovating every single house in my street. I can't sleep. The construction work starts at 7 in the morning. And so I am literally hiding in a bunker. This is World War II for me. I am uh, fundamentally now resorting to hiding out to do podcasts. Now I was thinking about World War II. I was thinking, well, the fourth industrial economy has come along and will podcasts actually even exist in, say, five or ten years' time? There's already new ideas which are springing to life when it comes to how podcasts might work into the future. Live class are now a thing. And I was thinking, you know, if podcasts exist in World War II, would, like, Hitler be doing a podcast? Would Hitler be interviewing Goebbels? Goebbels, tell us your life story. What's going on? It feels like a podcast every single day of the week at the moment, doesn't there? There's a podcast for everything. So I wonder if Churchill would be in the bunker doing the podcast. Monty, tell us what's going on in the front line. Uh, let's interview Stalin next week. So I think, obviously, the future is different to today. And the fourth industrial economy is a big topic I have spoken about many times in the past and I think it's something that property investors need to be very considerate of. There's a few dynamic changes ahead and I certainly think potentially 10 years from now you won't be listening to me on a podcast. You'll be, maybe I'll uh, be uh, virtual reality in your home or something like that. So there is some cool things which really will impact the real estate market. In October 2019, I travelled the country giving a speech around the great deflation. The great deflation of money, the great deflation of economic times. As I delivered that speech, I addressed some pretty fundamental concerns around the devaluation of money, and the future of the economy across the globe. And today I want to revisit that speech because much of what I spoke about during that month of October, and I'm sure some of my private clients would remember that speech, was that we are now going through a transformational decade. And The reason we get into real estate is usually to give us more time, give us more money, give us more meaning, freedom, or lifestyle. And a lot of that is actually going to be disrupted by a constantly changing world, which just really always feels like we have to pivot 
and move. I mean, I am doing this podcast. I've had to pivot from the gospodar. I'm now stuck in my wine room uh, under the house. But there's bigger pivots at stake and we have to really discuss them. I mean, will the United States actually be the superpower of the globe into the future? Will it be replaced by China? Will our isolated Australian economy actually grow into the future when it comes to, for example, green economics? Will our uh, minerals-based economy flourish? Is China and Australia on course for a collision? What does 2030 actually look like? And I think we all are now being played and there is this kind of like undertone of uncertainty because there is just so much noise out in the marketplace. And I think it's important to turn down the noise, but equally I think it's so important to make some smart decisions on how to invest in real estate by studying the undertone of noise. Now, we can see things like the multinationals are now playing the world. I mean, Facebook has taken on the Australian government, um, which is which is unheard of, right? I mean, back at World War II, like you just get six tanks and blow up Facebook. Now Facebook is dominating the world. I don't run my own company. I don't own my uh, company anymore. Facebook owns my company. If I want to lead, I pay Facebook. Facebook fundamentally is one of the biggest monopolies in the world. When you think about, I guess, even groups like Tesla, which is an overpriced stock, which I would like to add, I should have jumped on and had the chance and never did. It's an overpriced stock is now buying things like Bitcoin to drive the price up of Bitcoin, is now making more money out of Bitcoin than it is out of selling electric cars. And the world just feels a bit shit at times. I think there are a few things we need to be very mindful of. The media is flawed and fucks with us a lot. Uh, It sells us bad news and I guess it always has, but if it bleeds, it leads. And we need to be very wary as property investors of the media, that is for sure. I think the media really needs a bit of an overhaul as to how it approaches giving reliable information. It can be taken over by extremists and fundamentally cause absolute havoc because you end up getting served what you want to see. The inequality divide out in society is absolutely real. I think uh, we are absolutely seeing rich people get richer, people stuck getting poorer. I think there is, though, this sense in the Western world of entitlement. And quite often that entitlement absolutely comes back to haunt people They don't lay the foundation around working in an economy which is always morphing and changing. I think today as well, like, we are afraid around political correctness. Uh, We we are, without question, um, you know, quite often uh, now marginalised if we have a point of view and that can be uh, both healthy but unhealthy. I think the fourth industrial economy is going to lead to some breakthroughs around sustainability. I think we do live in a time where we sell out uh, instead of harnessing improvements for the future. We often, uh, I guess, almost rape the planet instead of working out how to make money out of fixing the planet. And I think some other things I, I feel the world could get better at is the inclusion of old people into our mainstream society. Particularly here in the Western world, we kind of live a separatist uh, environment when it comes to old people, right? We kind of um, marginalise them in my view. And I also think we now live in a time where everyone tells you they're a Bitcoin billionaire and how rich they are because... 
A 13-year-old kid bought $3,000 worth of Bitcoin in 2019 and puts on TikTok that he's a billionaire. Well, so much fake bullshit going around. It is absolutely messing with people's mind. And I will encourage you, every dollar you spend counts. So spend it with the right people, spend it at the right places, and spend it for the right things that nourish the planet. Now, I can tell you, we now live in a time where traditional companies are fundamentally not seen as value. Take AMP, for example. AMP is the big Australian, uh, you know, 50 years of business, building a uh, big, big business model that's involved in superannuation, the property services. It's... uh, It's been a traditional stakeholder of Australian economics. And I can tell you what, its share price is fundamentally worth. I think it's down to $1.30. People do not see value in the mainstream anymore. People are now seeing value in rare things. And the mind shift around society transforming is something from a behavioral point of view is so interesting so interesting to understand and i think if we can understand some of the behavioral elements of what is going on and economic elements we're going to do really really well as property investors into the future the whole world has dropped rates rates are fundamentally completely through the floor i mean money is now a fairly worthless tool when it comes to uh, you know assessing how the future value of things will will unfold and I think challenge for investors is to read between the lines so they can set themselves up with a bulletproof property portfolio not a house of cards the future is going to be different to the past and yes real estate is probably the best asset class to choose right now. Money's not a great asset class. Shares can be volatile. Mainstream shares like AMP falling through the floor. And then you've got uh, assets which are overvalued like Tesla just going through the roof. And it makes no commercial logic anymore. The only thing that is logical is someone needs a roof over their head and needs bricks and mortar. So there's challenges for investors and I can tell you the biggest challenge is probably unbiased advice, understanding how to turn down the noise and filter out the bullshit. The fact that you're getting uh, depressed over a 13-year-old kid buying $3,000 worth of Bitcoin, saying he's a Bitcoin millionaire and uh, just to get you know 100,000 likes, it's all bullshit. What's not bullshit is building a property portfolio where, hey, people got to live, bricks and mortar. And if we can understand some of these economic trends, I think we can create some really good value by really what I would call the rare earth principle. If anything's rare, it's worth money. And there's only so much land in big cities. There's only so many good locations in big cities. And for me, that is really what real estate is about and the real estate in the fourth industrial economy kind of colliding which will separate the haves and have nots in society remember money at a cash rate level is a tenth of one percent today when i traveled in october 2019 giving my speech about the fourth industrial economy I fundamentally noted that money is being devalued at a huge rate of knots. Governments around the world are just spending money hand over fist, printing money hand over fist, and it is devaluing currency at a rate which is now to the point where money actually may not have a value in the future unless it's transformed from the bank to an asset, a real underlying asset. And there is 
really no better underlying asset that is real than bricks and mortar. Money basics is the thing I think we need to talk about. You know, unlike any other good, an increase in the supply of money is not actually beneficial to society. And you think about the quantitative easing which has occurred around the globe. I mean, Australia is printing and uh, injecting a stimulus of around $320 billion into the economy. So an increase of money lowers its price and dilutes its fundamentally purchasing power. We're a little bit fortunate here in Australia that the rest of the world is actually worse than here. And so our dollar remains fairly strong, but a weaker currency, a weaker currencies around the globe are actually meaning the buying power of that money is being transformed. And it is distorting, I guess, money calculations. The supply of money expanding into the economy can fundamentally create inflation. And the reason we now have a lot of inflation when it comes to, uh, I guess, the transformation of money is that goods and services are going to cost more into the future. And again, if we look at some of the banana republics around the globe, places like Argentina, I mean, they've printed so much money that fundamentally, uh, really the only thing now worth something is real assets, art, uh, real estate, because money printing has distorted the value of really what is occurring in many parts of the globe. Here, we've got the handbrake being pulled up and we are going to end up in a, in a good place, but we've printed so much money that money supply is expanding the true value of assets. The definition of inflation is the action of inflating something or the condition of being inflated. You take $320 billion and you go and inflate an economy, you're going to have the corresponding effect. This is a wealth effect at the moment and many people can jump on this inflationary move and make bucket loads of money. The problem, of course, is those people that don't jump on the inflationary move won't make bucket loads of money. And in 2024, 2025, when a house in Brisbane goes from a median value of $550,000, $600,000 today to eight or $900,000, you start to live in a society where people actually can't afford to buy real estate. And I think, you know, much of the rest of the world has gone through this before us, but we are drifting to this place where real estate will be a have, not a right of passage for everybody in the economy. We're almost seeing this in New Zealand. New Zealand real estate prices some 20, 30, sometimes 40% more expensive than Australia. The cost to build new real estate over in New Zealand, the lack of production of real estate uh, is just uh, incredible to see just how expensive real estate is over in New Zealand. And, you know, in New Zealand, secondhand real estate is not liquid. You know, you can only get as an investor a 60% loan on secondhand real estate in New Zealand, 60% loan to value ratio. So, what that fundamentally does is it removes much of the marketplace from buying secondhand properties. And as investors, they, they shop in the first hand market. The reason uh, for that is to one, get the economy spending and not trap money in the real estate economy, but two, just give an opportunity for first buyers or upgraders to actually get into the property marketplace and not um, have to do it as a rent investor. Here in Australia, you know, the, the economic shifts around the economy, around 
uh, the future economy is going to eventually eliminate a lot of people from the real estate marketplace. We have real wage risk here in Australia. Wages aren't growing. To grow wages, the Reserve Bank has stated it needs an unemployment rate of 4.5% for people to get a pay rise. So we got uh, some real challenges when it comes to inequality in Australia. And the reason I point this out and harp on about it is to make sure you get off the fence and get more and more assets because assets will inflate, but wages won't. What that'll eventually mean is a distortion between what we earn and what an asset is worth, creating a challenge for future property ownership that if you own the wrong real estate, fundamentally, there may not be a robust market layered underneath this particular growth rate uh, to to take your asset off you. In other words, if you're going to go out and buy something that is falling down, that is shit, that is in a bad location, that is just cheap, fundamentally, the inequality behind this layer of activity is not going to be there for you to have a market to. Now, I teach this a lot to my students. We've got to buy in A-grade locations that mirror the economy of the future because people in the economy of the future, the haves, will be circling the best locations, the best neighborhoods, the middle class, good neighborhoods, not wanting to go somewhere cheap and cheerful. The cheap and cheerful marketplace will grow in this inflation. However, there fundamentally may actually be a lack of demand after this growth for the cheap and cheerful location. Why? Inequality. People won't have the wages to buy the asset. So we need to be very, very careful around this because, again, I think we're seeing the economy morph and buying real estate is going to be about the rare earth principle. Finding good locations, finding good blocks of land, um, good places to own real estate where people are, are really pumped to get involved in uh, owning real estate and have money. Otherwise, we're going to end up in this place which falsifies the economy. And I would say about 40% of the real estate marketplace today is a what I would call a blunder economy, a faux pas economy. It's falsified. It's going up not because people want to live there. It's going up because people are racing to beat the inflation which is occurring. And what that means is we're seeing people jump into the marketplace in areas where you would not traditionally see huge amounts of sales volume taking on bad assets and uh, doing so not comprehending that the future economy is going to be very, very different. And I think low rates are here to stay, which is a good thing. But eventually, if prices skyrocket uh, and you know, you're going to be the beneficiary of that, but also just understand that you don't necessarily want to be in a marketplace where no one is there to buy your asset off you. And without question, the debasement of the currency is driving this. The Australian dollar is fundamentally being flooded with more Australian dollars. It's being printed hand over fist. And we just need to play the game which is on offer, okay? Play the game which is on offer. And it does lend itself to obviously cryptocurrency and I think, you know, why crypto is seen as a gold-like asset is there's only a certain percentage of crypto floating around. So rather than uh, central banks being able to print it at the moment in any way, uh, you've got a, a, a fundamentally what is perceived to be a stable currency because it can't be duplicated. And a lot of this relates to getting off the gold standard. Back in 1971, Australian dollar was, was kind of fixed to the amount of gold it had in the bank. And uh, obviously, um, you can't stimulate the economy then by printing more money if 
you don't have the gold. And so the idea of getting rid of the gold standard actually occurred. And over the last 50 years, fundamentally, each year, many economies print more money and fail to ever get into surplus. If you look at the American uh, economy, I mean, it is just in so much debt, so much printing of money that goes on. You might see that on TV a bit. You know, quite often um, the government there runs out of money to pay public servants and then they have to have a big debate in the Congress and in the Senate to print more money to pay um, fundamentally uh, public servants. So I think there's a statistic like one in every five American dollars did not exist uh, two years ago, they've printed so much money. And eventually, all of this leads to people wanting to find other assets. And crypto, if you like, is really a fuck you investment. It is basically saying to central banks, we no longer believe in you. We're going our own way. And because we can do that off a laptop using blockchain, we're, we're fundamentally going to uh, create a decentralized system that is is all about sticking it to the man. I think even um, I guess people like Elon Musk, who's 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 really uh, uh, you know he's he's really a contrarian. He's almost like now driving the price of Bitcoin up because Tesla's buying Bitcoin. And he's not really doing it to make money. He's doing it to almost lead this kind of um, contrarian charge, if you like, in, in both the share market and the crypto marketplace. But I think what is, what is real is we got to understand that um, leverage into, into, for example, the crypto market is, is nothing like the real estate market. And still today, um, you know, crypto for the most part is, is a little bit unknown by the masses. I think 83% on a recent survey by PwC, 83% of society still doesn't really um, subscribe to the fact that crypto will actually be a future, I guess, player in, in broad level um, economics. Now, I, I put crypto in the speculation basket of investing. And um, as you may have heard in my past episodes, you know, I'm a big believer of um, diversification, but I'm also a big believer of building wealth through leverage and stable assets like like real estate, right? And anything rare is going to go up. A rare location is going to go up. A location that's in more demand is rare. It's going to go up. Whether you own an apartment there, a villa, a, a townhouse or in a house, it's going to go up. And rare dirt, it, it's going to go up. You know, there's only so much real estate around and there's just more and more demand than there is people with real estate. And that is something that I think is such an easy formula for people to understand. And I think you're going you're gonna to see the best of real estate into the future in the right locations. And you guys know I teach, obviously, let's buy in a live, work, play, knowledge, wellness, or mobile neighborhood. And you can fundamentally end up in a place which is, is incredibly, incredibly value, valued into the future. Remember, the only way out of this is austerity. The only way to balance the books is to stop spending at some point. And that's why I think it's really crucial to own some key assets right now as opposed to flipping assets because when the spending stops and uh, there is going to be a recall on, on money, right? People are going to need more money in their back pocket and if the government's not putting it in their back pocket and business isn't flourishing, well, you're going to end up in a place where, again, we have the have and have not society, inequality. And I teach this a lot like steer clear of the tenants who are going to be half a week away from broke. You don't want them in your life. You want good assets with people who are stimulated by the future economy, not the breakdown of money. 
And we are absolutely seeing some of the biggest shifts in the fourth industrial economy right now unfolding. Uh, We are literally seeing smart economy evolve. Now, I couldn't get a job in my own company. I'll tell you that right now. If I was uh, applying to work at uh, one of my companies, I would fail. I don't think I would get the job. I don't think my HR department would give me the job. I have very few skills. Um, I have uh, terrible um, technical skills. I literally um, hide from reports. I'm kind of like the polar opposite of what a good, uh, talented human is today. I literally can use a telephone and my voice. That is all I have. And fundamentally, the work of tomorrow is highly skilled. And again, I would not be able to get a job at uh, any of my companies today. Like I would probably get to round two and then they would say, hey, Sammy, hey, thanks very much, mate. But um, yeah, your technical prowess is not good enough to be part of the, uh, the machine here. Um, I would suggest you go and reskill. So I'm blessed that I'm surrounded by incredibly talented people. And in in my group of companies, you know, we have sort of close to, I think, 87, 90 people at the moment who are incredibly smart at what they do. We run fundamentally a knowledge company. Positive Real Estate, uh, uh, our six-star team service through our affiliated companies is actually uh, a tech company for, uh, it, it seems strange to say, because we're very centric about real estate, but the people who are leading that business, I'm, I'm a founder of the business, but now I really speak around real estate. I've gone on to master real estate. People in my business have gone on to master becoming a tech company of real estate. That's how crazy it is. Again, I couldn't get a job there. I don't know uh, where I could get a job, to be blunt. Um, I'm just fortunate that I'm replacing my job through real estate income. And I say this because right now around the world, we are being transformed. As we speak, three people are living in space. Right now today, a robot is exploring Mars and looking for life forms and relaying back information in real speed to planet Earth. In 2019, scientists found a black hole for the first time. Black holes were a myth. It was some 7,000 light years away, and they discovered that a black hole is actually a real thing. Right now, your smartphone can detect melanoma on your skin. You can uh, put your smartphone app on around melanoma and scan your body and it will detect a cancerous melanoma and you can go then to the doctor. That is crazy. In fact, the detection rate of melanoma, melanoma is reported to be better from your iPhone than a visual check by a doctor. We are being transformed. Society is being transformed. In 2020, in New Zealand, in Hawke's Bay, robots did the world's first apple harvest. Robots. The first time a robot harvested apples. Once upon a time, we needed backpackers to harvest apples. Now robots are actually capable of doing that. In Poland... New solar panels that have been created can hold more energy than ever before. Solar panels now can absolutely transform real estate and housing. We are now passing the age of solar panels being able to run a small component of your housing needs to the point where we are now being transformed by technology. Not long ago, if I told you any of this, you would have said I was insane. If you 
If I said, right now, we're looking for Martians on Mars, you would have said, you're off your, you're off your rocker, bud. But this is true. If I told you five years ago your iPhone can detect cancer on your body, you would say bullshit, right? And we got to think about that because, I don't know, was it 15, 16 less years ago the iPhone was created? Was it like 2008 or something? The, I, the smartphone was created. I mean, before then we were using, we were using, we we're playing Snake. I've said that before. We were playing Snake on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the Nokia. So the world is now standing on the shoulder of giants. Tech companies rule the world. That's without question. Uh, businesses which are morphing into tech companies where the founders of the business couldn't even get a job are actually starting to transform society. And where those people choose to live, work and play is going to be the absolute beneficial uh, or uh, they're going to be the benefit of certainly the fourth industrial economy. So we're in a new way of thinking. Um, Without question, I think the most powerful people on planet Earth today are not the share market guys from from Wall Street there or washed up, not the oil barons or mining magnates. It's without question the tech companies. Tech companies rule the world. And we've seen that recently with Australian government and Facebook going toe-to-toe when it comes to how information can be relayed um, using the Facebook system. If you took Apple, Amazon and Microsoft, their combined GDP is bigger than India. India has fundamentally over a billion people. We are seeing Facebook uh, start to control so many companies around the world because code is actually the new currency. The businesses that hold the code are actually winning the war. And this is why Bitcoin is actually doing really, really well because it is code that is the currency. And the reason uh, we are seeing, I guess, code become so valuable is a zero marginal cost effect. Now, imagine you had a watch, just one of them, and you could sell that same watch a million times. That is fundamentally code. Today, of course, if you are a watchmaker, you would need a million people to buy a million watches to sell it a million times. However, code fundamentally allows businesses to create one thing and sell it multiple times and do that without shipping costs. There's no logistics around it. It happens in light speed. And that code has no latency of fundamentally growing old because it can always be updated. Think about every time you wake up, there's probably on your iPhone, if you're using an iPhone or Samsung, there's probably 10 different updates occurring at any one time, any morning on your iPhone. Zero latency of updating. So back in October 2019, I positioned my village, if you like, my tribe, my customers to prepare to buy in the future economy. There are five major disruptors which are influencing the world. DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, and blockchain tech. These five disruptors are all happening on society this decade. Now, you have to go back like 150-odd-plus years to find a period in time where there was so much churn and disruption. You have to go back to the 1880s when three different uh, disruptors were invented, the telephone, the steam engine, and uh, the telephone, the steam engine, and electricity, all invented at the same time. Now, you can imagine back then there was probably someone who was like, oh, you know, the telephone, that's not going to take off. Electricity, 
that's bullshit. I'm using my candle. And really, if we examine DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, and blockchain tech, 83% of society doesn't actually understand it, according to PwC. They're almost like looking at electricity going, I don't understand it, if they were the same person back in 1880, right? Those three things, the telephone, electricity, and the steam engine, caused so much havoc to jobs, but also created so many new industries in that period of time. And really the fourth industrial economy is, is fundamentally just a transform or shift of jobs. And the first was the mechanical um, steam um, transformation. The second was really the first and the second was this kind of electric um, transformation. And I guess the, the third was like the invent of computers. And now we are in what we call the smart economy, the fourth economy, the, the real transformation to, to things working autonomous and what that is fundamentally doing is creating more decentralizing in the economy. The fact I am working from a bunker today is because I am decentralized. I do not need an office to do what I do. I want to live somewhere good, don't get me wrong. I want to live and have an awesome bucket list life. So for me, it's great locations, great real estate, it's uh, great areas to fundamentally work. And when COVID washes up and we're all vaccinated, there is no question. I'll probably do a few weeks work out of the Cook Islands because I'm decentralized. I'm in the bunker. And that in itself is occurring in this fourth industrial economy. Realistically, by 2030, 50% of internet traffic to homes will be appliances and, and devices, smart things. We've all seen Alexa, Alexa, turn on the music. Alexa, drop the blinds. That is going to continue. The smart home uh, system is evolving and devices are getting better and better and better to the point where, again, making much older real estate less functional and redundant if in the future consumer trends are going to be driven around smart technology. Blockchain tech will absolutely revolutionize uh, banking. Um, we are now seeing banks, I guess, pivot to be more online, more digitalized. Um, and what that will fundamentally do, we will directly connect borrowers and data to lenders. So it's very possible into the future, the way you spend will be examined by data and the banks will just fundamentally know everything. They will lend you money based on who you are rather than, well, at a broad level, everyone can get a 3% home loan. Perhaps you can get a 2% home loan because your data is going to be better than someone else's data. Perhaps your data is not good and that means you're going to be high risk and you're going to need to get a 4% home loan. So again, I think we've got to take advantage of the great inflation occurring right now, but the deflation of money. I think into the future, cybercrime is going to be something that's really, really big. Um, and I think you're starting to see even laundering of money through crypto a fair bit of the time. So uh, cybercrime is going to be real. I think a lot of, a lot of our bank accounts will be hacked think we need to be really smart around where our money is at. And again, knowing, I guess, this stuff is coming, it just makes the argument for real estate even more powerful, but good real estate. Real estate for the haves, not the have-nots. Now, I do think this podcast will actually not be a podcast in 10 years' time. Somehow, I'll be doing virtual reality in your home. You'll be literally... Uh, pressing the button, I'll be like Princess Leia uh, being zoomed into your home and you'll see me doing this podcast talk. Again, we have come a long way uh, since really the invention of 
radio back in the 1930s. We are going to continue to grow. And what that is going to do is mean jobs lost, jobs gained, the future of work is going to be transformed, the future of skills, a dominating society and dominating wages. Automation and skill is what you need to invest in. Remember, I couldn't get a job at my own company. I am terrible with automation and I fundamentally have no skill. So understanding that is reshaping the world, reshaping the world. And I'm a big believer there's going to be enough work for everyone into the future. I do not believe the disruption of the fourth industrial economy is going to KO jobs en masse. In fact, it's just going to reshape the pecking order or reshape the class system of society. And it is going to mean that jobs are going to change and influencers are going to be uh, influencing how we, we, we assess what we want to do is also going to change. I think automation is going to reshape skills and wages. And the downside of that is minimal wage growth. However, we're going to live in a period of inflation. We live in the great deflation of wages and the great inflation of economic times. And without question, if you look at some of the studies around the impact of what that means is globally around 400 million workers are going to need to switch occupations into the coming decade, over the coming decade. And what that is, is around anywhere from 3 to 14% of the entire global workforce is going to need to switch occupation or acquire a new skill. And there are some growth sectors like health care, um, aged care. I mean, these, these places are, gro- these industries are growing off their head. People won't die, they're living forever. And so healthcare and and, and employment around that is going to be a big, big winner. Hence why I traditionally love investing uh, in real estate very close to good healthcare because I know healthcare workers are actually going to be the future jobs of tomorrow. I think you're going to find medical jobs, government jobs, skilled trades, essential jobs, knowledge jobs are all going to be the winners in the economy of the future. I think the idea of the back office is, is, is dead. I think um, a lot of that is going to continue to be um, explored overseas. Um, there's going to be great offices that companies have in, in other countries, in India and the Philippines. Um, and really, it's the front, um, I guess, face of skill which is the important part here where those people live and work is what is of interest to me because technology can answer the phone technology uh, can be the receptionist and I think as part of that global realignment many of those people who are in vulnerable jobs are going to need to go out and upskill and at the end of the day I think all of us property investors want to live off income. And I look at my personal career as a property investor and in the beginning it was all about growth. But in the end, it's actually all about income. I really don't care if my real estate grows anymore because I've got enough of it. Now it's this transformation to income. And I think a lot of real estate is designed to fail because the income of those areas is just not high enough, but the rising inflation of strata fees, council rates, taxes, etc., etc., is killing the cash flow of the cash cow. So we need to make sure our real estate is fundamentally in a good pocket. And I'm a big believer in the idea that The future economy is around smart areas and I've done past podcasts on really smart economics, which you can listen to. Um, But I will say, I think one of the biggest risks to property investors in the future is the location of your asset and the tenants who live in your asset 
will hold back your wealth because uh, of fundamental wage decline through the disruption age we're kind of living in. So tenant personas are going to be really, really important. And the future around that is, is again, what may even up being data-led where you can, uh, into the future, maybe assess someone's potential as a tenant and their income profile and mirror match that to your assets. So lots to think about. Um, Certainly, I think... um, as a, as a property investor, as an investor in shares, in crypto, um, I'm a big believer in building at least 80% of your wealth through real estate and uh, 10% in shares, 10% in speculative things like crypto. But don't rush out and just be uh, the guy that buys $20,000 worth of crypto to make $40,000. Be the person that leverages on some good real estate and um, invest in in what I would call smart economies. Bricks and mortar are going to be real assets into the future of a growing population, a disruptive fourth industrial economy, having assets located in some really good pockets is going to make you absolutely a bucket load of money. And what that money will do is it means you're going to keep up with the inflation cost out in society without potentially even getting a wage increase yourself. You will end up as a have, not a have not. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed the show today. Uh, Straight from the bunker. Uh, Thanks for listening. And I will catch you soon on the next episode of The Urban Property Investor. Thanks for tuning in to The Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of The Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.